Well, thank you, Andre, for your incredible work in getting this organized and getting these ongoing lectures organized. And thanks to the Chicago branch for making this happen. So as some of you know, um, we're having audio problems. It seems with Andre's transmission. So I'm in the unfortunate position of introducing myself. And I, I don't wanna to spend too much time doing that. Um, I have been a uh, Waldorf teacher for many years, taken several classes, also worked with children with special needs. And for the past 14 years, I've been working almost exclusively online, starting the online conferences for grades one through eight, uh, which um, are still in existence and still drawing hundreds of teachers a year, long before COVID necessitated working online. And um, also uh, lecturing mostly online and uh, working very hard with uh, Rudolf Steiner's work and impulses and questions about our time. So, let me just stop right there. And what I'm going to do is uh, talk about two things in particular. The first is about uh, a continuation of my talk last year, also in May in the Chicago branch, about the situation of Waldorf education as we approach the 100th anniversary of Steiner's death date. And um, I will talk more about that. And then I'm also going to speak about the way in which the Anthroposophical Society, the Anthroposophical Movement, particularly in North America, especially in the United States, um, also reflects some of these challenges and difficulties and perhaps offer some suggestions about how, how we can work with this. So, let me begin by, um, I'm a, it, this is a little difficult because this is very unusual in an anthroposophical lecture and may even be prohibited. So I ask your forbearance if I begin this way. I am going to begin by um, holding myself accountable for what I said in my last lecture. Okay, I know this is never done in anthroposophical and Waldorf circles. Accountability essentially doesn't exist. So I, I hope this isn't too disturbing. So last year, I made um, two important predictions. One of them was that by the year 2025, by the 100th anniversary of Steiner's death, there would be a clear and decisive severance of Waldorf education from anthroposophy, that um, anthroposophy would no longer be considered uh, as the force underlying Waldorf education, and that this would be in the private schools as well as in the public schools. My um, second uh, prediction was that there would be a third way, not the private schools as we know them today, not the public schools as we know them today. They would continue in one form or another, but there would then be smaller schools connected with communities, perhaps the Christian community church, perhaps an anthroposophical clinic, a BD farm, small schools, which would almost have a monastic existence and try to keep the flame of anthroposophy alive among their teachers and the parent body as well. But that this would be very small, homeopathic as I described it. So the question is, what's happened in the past year? Um, is, has anything happened to show that what I said was a complete exaggeration or that there's some degree of truth to it? Now, 
Last year, again, I spoke at the decisive moment in this um, ongoing trajectory of the severance as coming in 2020, when the Association of Waldorf Schools of North America denounced Rudolf Steiner for his racist statements. And I can tell you one thing about that statement. Not only did it get changed to be much milder, but I can tell you, if you ever read it, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. You, you were under some kind of deception thinking that you read that statement. No such statement was ever, ever made. So let's speak about accountability here. It's gone. It never happened. Oh, yes, we're concerned about some things with Steiner, but we never said that. And this is part of this picture that it is definitely going on. Steiner is constantly being denounced and disavowed, but it's being done in a way very quietly, very behind the scenes. And this is especially the case in the growing, growing work that's going on, um, leaving anthroposophical concepts and methodologies behind and bringing in things from outside the Waldorf movement, which have little to do with child development, very, very little to do with Steiner's methods and insights into the spiritual world. And this is especially true right now in the work with DEIJ, D -E -I -J, um, in which a lot of time is spent in summer conferences, 20, 25% of a conference now may be spent in issues around diversity. That would be fine if the conferences extended their five and a half day period, but they don't, they can't. So what's happening is in the name of expanding Waldorf education, Waldorf education is actually getting diminished. We are subtracting anthroposophy in order to add concepts which, unlike Steiner's, which really come from a path of initiation, research into the spiritual world, we are in a certain way bringing in ideas that come almost exclusively from the intellectual soul and have little to do with the children and their development and especially their destinies. So this is definitely going on. Now, let me read something to you that appeared in my email um, about 10 days ago. The Association of German Waldorf Schools is planning to de-hierarchize, quite a word for you, de-hierarchize and decolonize its history curriculum by 2025. Certainly the word decolonize comes from the uh, DEI justice movement. Dehierarchize, I'm not sure where that comes from, George Orwell or something like that. Understanding global networking, thinking in a cosmopolitan way, meeting changes constructively and valuing diversity. Humanity faces many challenges at present not only in having to deal with the ecological and geopolitical crisis. In addition, we need to scrutinize our interrelations on a daily basis and struggle to keep our democracy alive. This may all be completely true, but these are all adult issues. They have nothing to do with children and to a great extent, not even a great deal to do with high school students. History must not be confused with information about the past, says Michael Zeck, professor of cultural sciences and their didactics at Alanis University, an anthroposophically um, uh, inspired university in Germany. The passed down narratives of Europeans have had their day, he says, and history as a school subject needs to be de-hierarchized and decolonized, and students must be enabled to orient themselves in the stories through reflection and narration. Once again, 
what is he talking about? It, these, are, these concepts are so abstract and so intellectual. When is this change going to occur? In the year 2025. So if nothing else, here we have the clarion call of a severance, a breaking away from Rudolf Steiner's approach to the child and his or her development and into something different. Now, it's important for us to recognize that the approach to the Waldorf curriculum that Steiner gave certainly had to do with the education of the child to meet the world of 1919, which is a different world from that of today. It had two other tasks as well. One of them was to get interest and therefore help in the subjects being taught from hierarchical beings. Steiner created the Waldorf School and Waldorf Education to get angels, archangels and archai in particular, more engaged in the life of humanity, more engaged in the all important methodologies of education as they had been, let's say, in the school of Chartres or in Plato's Academy or, or educational institutions of that caliber. So the hierarchies are engaged, they are there, and they cannot do otherwise than help teachers manage their class, teach the children, and inspire the children in a way that concepts that are de-hierarchizing, that's an interesting term in this regard, and decolonizing simply can't do. And no less importantly, Steiner was concerned that children were going to be entering into the physical world with greater and greater challenges. That in addition to the old souls who had incarnated frequently and knew their way about the earth, there were going to be increasing numbers of young souls who had perhaps never before incarnated when Christ had had an influence directly on the earth, who will have great difficulties in their moral life, difficulties developing conscience. The curriculum was for them as well. Also souls who had lived only in the planetary spheres, who had never incarnated before, were coming in the 20th and centuries beyond that into an earthly body for the first time. The Waldorf curriculum was a way for them to learn what had gone on while they were observing the earth from a great distance. And there were souls whom Steiner said did not belong on the earth at all at this time, but were breaking through the, gate, the gates, breaking through the threshold because they wanted to be on the earth when a great battle of good and evil were occurring in our time. So we have a great many souls who are naives, um, who are, um, you know, those who look at the world and say, oh, brave new world that has such creatures in it, Mirandas. And the Waldorf curriculum, down to its details, was there to help those souls find their way into this incarnation even if they weren't supposed to be on the earth, the curriculum would help them find their way. To simply throw that out, a bunch of professors in Alanis or anywhere else, um, a bunch of intellectual professors in American universities saying that um, you know, the political concerns of the moment are important and nothing else. This is not only harming the child in this incarnation, but will also stand as a great obstacle for future incarnations. Will stand as a great obstacle for souls being able to find their way to help earth evolution. So the curriculum is more than just a long list of historical fables. It has a lot in it moment by moment, year by year, 
that really helps the child say yes to their stage of incarnation. And we need to give it a great deal of thought and a great deal of care before we toss it out. And I'd say another aspect of this is that through working with the curriculum, a Waldorf class teacher in particular has the possibility of undergoing a modern path of initiation. A path which will, on the one hand, make them a better teacher along the way, but also will give them those capacities, those forces, those insights to be able to help groups of children who might otherwise be helpless on the earth. So it's really the esoterics that live in and behind the Waldorf curriculum, the Waldorf method, and the work of the hierarchies with and for and around a class teacher that are of great, great importance. Now I should mention as part of this severance going on that in January of this year at the Alliance for Public Waldorf Education Conference, uh, one of the leadership of the Alliance gave a talk in which he told teachers, this was a talk given to uh, everyone present at the conference, that they should not accept uh, what esoterics is bringing. That if somebody tells them this or that is coming out of esoteric knowledge, that's a dead giveaway, don't listen to them. Nor should they listen to anybody or give any credence to someone who starts to talk about the hierarchies. Because he said the hierarchies, this goes back a thousand years to Thomas Aquinas. You know, this has nothing to do with our time. This is an anthroposophy, and this isn't what you need as a charter school teacher by any means. This was what he said. So on the one hand, he manages to skewer Steiner, an esotericist if there ever was one. And not only that, he manages to poke some jabs at Thomas Aquinas, Steiner's past incarnation. I have never before seen somebody do this so skillfully, not only get after Steiner, but even get after his past incarnation. I guess there wasn't enough time for him to skewer Aristotle as well while he was at it. But this is what is happening right now, rapidly, sometimes quietly, sometimes as in that presentation, very openly. Um, Waldorf education is being brought into 3D, decolonized, dehierarchized, and above all, de-steinerized. And um, certainly within a couple of years, we're going to see the trajectory of this moving more and more rapidly. Now, it's very interesting if we think about these souls um, and how we can work with them, how we can bring these souls what they need without having Steiner's presence, Steiner's assistance in the spiritual world. Um, interestingly enough, according to some, Steiner may very well be incarnated right now. He may not be in the spiritual world anymore at all. He may be, in fact, in the American West, where he is said to have said he would appear. So maybe he's looking for a school. And ironically, the decline of Waldorf education is happening right now, while Steiner himself may perhaps be attending a school methodology, a school system that he helped to create. So another one of these many ironies. Now, this I received uh, a couple of days ago from the Saratoga uh, Waldorf School in New York, citing low enrollment over a number of years and a need to refocus energies on developing other programming, the Waldorf School of Saratoga Springs 
announced it will close its high school after the completion of the year as the independent private learning institution rebrands itself to focus on serving pre-K to eighth grade students. And then in an email, the Waldorf uh, administrator said that this is a major step forward. Closing the high school is really a great thing. Um, Rebranding our school and refocusing our mission will ensure that we are able to provide Waldorf education to the region for decades to come. And once again in the article, the Waldorf School of Saratoga Springs is rebranding itself as a pre-K to grade eight institution and so on and so forth. So rebranding, now where does this come from? This is the world of the corporation. And not to say that Steiner didn't respect business people. In fact, he said that many initiates would come back as business people. And Emil Molt, a businessman, if ever there was one, was the first real director of the first Waldorf School. Nothing wrong with that. But of course, Emil Molt was not your uh, ordinary kind of businessman at all. He was already a very devoted student of Steiner's. So rebranding, this is one very important aspect of what's going on the corporate influence in the Waldorf School. Another influence coming is drawing on people from the military world to direct Waldorf schools. This is just beginning, but I think we're gonna see more and more of it. Now, you know, given the volatility of school board meetings and the violence that erupts, it seems every other day in schools throughout the country, there's no reason that this couldn't all happen in a Waldorf school. And maybe it is good to have somebody with a military mind and military strategy there um, who will be ready to fight, hard to say. But something else we can associate with military people is uniforms. Now, that's the last thing in the world you bring to a Waldorf school, right? You can't have a uniform in a Waldorf school. Um, we're far too independent and far too individualized. And yet, very interestingly, a military person who is the administrator of a very established Waldorf school um, felt that for the children's understanding of what racism is really like as an experience, that the high school students should all wear black hoodies. And when they are outdoors, they should put the hoodie up and get the feeling of what it's like when somebody standing behind you thinks that you are a person of color because you're wearing a black hoodie. So actually the high school students are wearing uniforms, black hoodies. Now, yes, from the back, the intention is that they should look like people of color. What about the front? What do they look like there? Like monks. They look like medieval monks. Now this is interesting because right now, again, as a decolonization uh, move, Parseval in many Waldorf high schools is being replaced sometimes by the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, Faust is likely going to be replaced. Dante Arrivederci, he's going to be gone soon as well. So the entire medieval treasure of epics, which were composed by initiates, which allow the student to go back to their most recent lifetime and deal with unfinished business and get a sense of the soul and spirit forces that lived in them at that time. That's verboten right now. But instead, they get to dress up like monks and perhaps are having that experience anyway. So this is not something that uh, one hears about very much. It's very, very interesting. Very little accountability. And when it turns out that the students don't wanna do this anymore, 
and it turns out it was really a failure, we'll never hear that it happened either. Um, so this is another aspect of what we are facing right now in our time. Um, and we can say that the Anthroposophical Society in America, which has many, many times depended on Waldorf teachers retired or sometimes even teachers who are still active to be its general secretary or to be in leadership positions. I can think of many, many people, John Root, Dietrich, not Dietrich Asin, John Root, um, Torin Finzer, John Bloom, right now, um, many, many teachers who have come in that role. They are not going to be there because their own background, their own life in the school will be more and more devoid of Steiner's influence. And this is going to weaken the society and weaken a source of talent, we might say, a source of leadership, a source of experience, which is going to be uh, very noticeable before too long. But um, it's okay because we're rebranding as well. The anthroposophical world has also discovered that. Um, I just received this today, actually. Um, Parsifal and Firefizz, uh, his brother. This is going to be a series of lectures from May 22nd, June 5th, and June 19th. This thought-provoking thought series will engage a multiple multitude of voices from the Parsifal Project. Through engaging with the medieval tale of Parsifal and his black brother, Firefizz, we will ask, how can ritual be a healing structure to connect with the ostracized other and build wholeness and inclusion in our society? How can we reimagine this quest for the Holy Grail as a collective or collaborative social process, a journey to the other, rather than as a singular quest for individual enlightenment. So, okay, Parsifal is disappearing from the canon of the Waldorf School, but here it comes. But it's very interesting, the approach that's taken to Parsifal to sort of modernize it. It's actually an anti-racist tract. It's actually about the collective, a term that's gotten very, very popular and which raises many hackles and people who feel Waldorf is becoming completely Marxist. And it's also this idea that the quest for individual enlightenment is not important that this is no longer what we should be looking at, but rather finding ways to heal in our society. So Waldorf and especially anthroposophy in general is being rebranded as a healing methodology, as something that will help us with our social relationships, help us overcome our depression, um, help us feel more whole. And little and little, less and less, and finally nothing will be spoken of as the path of initiation, especially because we are going to find that Steiner's actual works are going to be less and less available in their original form, that we're going to be getting guides, we're going to be getting a uh, a summation, sort of Cliff's notes of Steiner's work, because people just don't have the time or the strength or the patience to plow through his often boring and dense prose. So let's make it easier. This won't only happen because um, human beings are, are choosing to do this as well. Uh, but we're going to find it in a, another place as well. Um, Several months ago, 
when Chatbot 3 first came out, Chatbot GPT-3 first came out, uh, a member of the Mistech group asked it a question, who is Aramon? And then asked, who is Lucifer? And then what is the anthroposophical interpretation of Aramon and Lucifer? It's a fairly lengthy answer. Chatbot's very good at doing this in a very short period of time. But just let me read a couple of sentences. Aramon is a figure from ancient Persian mythology, also known as Agramanyu, who is often depicted in the spirit of evil and darkness. Who is Lucifer? Lucifer is a figure associated with evil and is often portrayed as a fallen angel who rebelled against God. The name Lucifer is derived from the Latin word for light bringer. And in classical mythology, the planet Venus was referred to as the morning star or Lucifer. And then a one sentence part of the long answer about the third question, what is the anthroposophical interpretation of Araman and Lucifer? In the teachings of anthroposophy, which is a spiritual movement founded by Rudolf Steiner, Araman and Lucifer are seen as spiritual beings who play a role in the evolution of humanity in the spiritual world. And then he goes into much greater key, into much greater detail. And in fact, the answer that's given is a whole lot better than most of the essays that I have read written by master's degree students at Sunbridge College. Um, much, much better, uh, much more widely versed and simply better written in terms of grammar and style. In fact, by proudly digitizing so much of Rudolf Steiner's work, making it available to the point where far more people find Rudolf Steiner online than in actual books. We have made all of it available to all of the artificial intelligence systems that are arriving basically every couple of days now. Steiner is in a way a hostage to artificial intelligence, just like anything else now that's on the internet is. It's going to be possible for his words to be retrieved much more rapidly, but in the way that chat GPT tends to work, even if it's in its most recent iterations, also with slight inaccuracies, with mistakes. And when you notice a mistake and ask for a correction, sometimes you get an even bigger mistake as the, uh, Chatbot works hard to defend itself. It's so-called the uh, what are called hallucinations or, or citations that are completely made up. In other words, people will be reading versions of Steiner, interpretations of Steiner that are mostly correct, but a little bit off here and there. And even when they are completely accurate, and I would say that the answers that I read here were completely accurate, they have no human quality to them. They are simply sentences that are being statistically completed because these words tend to be found together a lot. And in Steiner, that's fairly easy to do. So this is where people are going to go I would say within six months to a year, there are probably going to be more people asking an artificial intelligence app something about Steiner than simply trying to find it in a book. At least Google search tells you to read books and gives you that possibility. At least Wikipedia gives you citations which are generally accurate. But this is going to open up Steiner in a way to um, the possibility of rampant misinterpretation. I believe that there are very powerful aramonic forces 
living in the realm of artificial intelligence, even in that term, intelligence, trying to completely distort what that word really means. Compare that to what Steiner has to say about cosmic intelligence. And Araman is going to little by little work his way into the digital versions of Steiner's work until finally one will not know whom to trust and want to trust. The same issue living so strongly in our culture today in relation to the media, politicians, so many things, this is going to be coming as AI becomes a more and more powerful force. But we need not despair. Maybe some of you recall that Buck Henry song from the 1960s, They're Gonna Put Me in the Movies. It was made popular by Ringo Starr, right? Um, okay, um, we can begin the next AGM of the Anthroposophical Society singing that song because I can announce that as of a month ago, in the United States, it was possible, not just anywhere, but it will be more and more possible for you to watch a commercial film with a star, at least a European all-star cast called Hilma. And this is a film about the life of Hilma Op Klimt, who's become quite famous over the last few years. Um, and in this film, we see Rudolf Steiner depicted, portrayed by an actor for the first time ever in a commercial film, which will be seen in the end, of course, by millions of people. He appears because he was invited by the real Rudolf Steiner, was invited by Hilma to uh, view her work when he was in Sweden giving a lecture tour and he was a bit reluctant, finally went and um, had some critical things to say about her. He had two concerns. Number one was that these were painted under the influence of beings that she met at seances. And he said that this is not a method that in our time one should use for inspiration. Um, Maybe we could say AI has some of those qualities today. And secondly, he also said, and this is less, uh, tends to be quoted less, said what you are painting here are aspects of the etheric world for which humanity is not yet ready. You should, you're gonna have to wait some time uh, before these can be released. And interestingly enough, at the time of her death, she would not let her work be shown, but ask for several decades to pass, which is why she's becoming so famous right now. So Steiner is pictured um, by a, a German actor named Tom Vlaschia, whom you probably remember from his role as a, the leader of the shape changers in Game of Thrones, right? You probably saw that. Very interesting that this is the individual chosen. He bears an uncanny relationship, resemblance to Steiner, and clearly practiced walking like Steiner, speaking like him. So if you ever come across this movie, it's simply called Hilma. Um, there you can see the first ever film depiction. And here we could say again, Steiner is now captured in a completely material way. And there'll be many people who see this film and that's the only impression they ever have of Steiner. This kind of, kind of scolding um, uh, charlatan of, of types who is not really sensitive to a woman. Because she is a woman painter, he's much less sensitive to her. And this is very much the theme of this movie. So we do not see Steiner at his best by any means, but there you go. Um, this is the time in which we live. As Andy Warhol said so well, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes. So 
what can we do about this? What can the society do? Now, we have to remember that um, we are a small group, especially in the United States. The average age of uh, members that I have been told is age 60. We are an aging group, uh, which one would say on the face of it, um, doesn't give much hope for the future of uh, the anthroposophical society at any rate in the United States. And this brings me to uh, a recollection in 1980 or 81, somewhere around that time, uh, there was a huge conference, the largest anthroposophical conference ever held in the United States to which the Forstand, the executive group of the Gertianum appeared the first time they all came to the United States. And Virginia Cease, the only American member at that time, led the charge in a way. So there were many workshops which were also given besides the keynote lectures given by the uh, Forstand speakers. And uh, one of the speakers uh, suddenly got ill. One of the uh, workshop leaders couldn't appear. And I was given a phone call. Um, and uh, Henry Barnes called me and asked, could I do a workshop? And uh, I said, well, uh, let me give it some thought. He said, call me back in half an hour. We're, we're really in a desperate situation. Obviously, if they asked me, they must have been really desperate. So I called him back and said, I can. And he said, what's the topic? I said, life after death. There was a long silence at the other end. And Henry Barnes, who was no, uh, no spring chicken in, at that time either, said, no. I said, why not? He said, Eugene, this is a very important conference. We are trying to bring new life to the Anthroposophical Society in America. We, we, we wanna bring life, not death. It, I don't think people would be interested and I'm not sure we want those words on the brochure. I said, well, Henry, I'm sorry. I've been working as a coworker at the fellowship community for nearly 10 years. And all we ever talk about there is death. That's the only thing I really know. So um, I could talk about that. Ask me to talk about life. I'm not sure. I can't say I really lived much of a life for the last 10 years either, but I've really learned a lot about the dead and dying. He called me back a little while later. He said, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> so imagine that. 1980, you know, we're, we're talking now 42 years ago, the fear of talking about death, the fear of anything that wasn't live, that means youthful and, and young. And um, very interesting because at that time, Paul Sharp, who founded the fellowship and is perhaps the most profound thinker about the elderly individual um, whom the anthroposophical world has ever known. Um, he said to me, you know, it's very interesting that people think that an elderly person lives in the past. He said, but think about what Steiner says, after 72, it's your new karma that you're beginning to work on. You're, you're dropping away from your old karma. What's happening is that the future is streaming towards you and you are leaving the past behind. The difficulty of being old is that the future is overwhelming you and it's hard for you to be in the here and now and to remember things while this stream of new life, of life after death is coming your way. Now, I just wanna say I have no prejudice against the elderly. 60 years old, boy, that's a youngin for me. I'm 77 myself, so <laughs> the average age 60, oh yeah, we've got plenty of time to go. Um, but it's, I, I would agree with what Steiner said and I'd agree very much with what Paul Scharf said as well. So, okay, 
this is what I would suggest. How can we anthroposophists, and it doesn't just have to be 60 and over, but at least the average group, average age group, how can we help those Waldorf teachers who are not being given the anthroposophy that they need simply to carry on and do a half decent job teaching, who are be being forced into all of these endless discussions about their racism, about their uh, gender hangups, about whatever comes next, um, all the good causes that are out there, which have very little to do with a Waldorf school. So how can we help them? Well, maybe start study groups outside of the school. In many schools, there are no, there's no time to have anthroposophical study anymore because the DEIJ group has supplanted that or teachers are working in various healing sort of modalities and so on. Everything but what they need most crucially. So that's something we can do. But I'd like to take it further. I would like to suggest that a new section of the American Anthroposophical Society is formed, the elder section, okay? We've got a youth section and, uh, you, you know, well, I, I, when I go to a youth section to give a lecture, I see all these people there in their 40s and 50s. What are you doing here? Well, I feel young at heart, you know? Okay, so young people who feel old at heart, and there are a few like that, they can join the elder section as well. Now you may feel as Henry Barnes felt many years ago, oh my gosh, how depressing. Who in the world would wanna join an elder section? You know, no problem. I'm gonna rebrand it and we're gonna say this. The elder section, people are dying to join. How does that sound? That'll draw a lot of people, I'm sure. But to recognize that actually the aging of the anthroposophical society in the United States is an influx of future spiritual forces, which can become not a substitute, but at least become a help for the fact that Steiner is not going to be in the spiritual world and that the trillions of spiritual beings surrounding him, working with him and through him are not going to be there. We're going to, in a way, have to find our own beings, our own hierarchical connections, find the initiation through aging itself. And we should remember that Christian Rosenkreutz has said, to have lived more than once to age 100 because he needed to live that long to go through a full modern initiation. And this is one of the reasons that longevity is becoming such a possibility in our time. Not that it's necessarily filled with fun and games, not that it's pleasant, not that there aren't people wishing that they didn't have to be alive on the earth being so old and with so many issues. It's because it is part of a modern stream of initiation. So we should be rejoicing in a way at the average age being 60. And within a few years, the average age will probably be 70. So that's one thing to think about. Something else I wanna share before I conclude and we can stop for questions. Um, the first hundred years following Steiner's death, we could say was part of what will be an ongoing cycle throughout at least this cultural epoch of hundred year periods of anthroposophy. For 100 years, anthroposophy breathes out, it expands, and one has great conferences and great meetings and the membership grows and on and on and on. And then, and of course there's a cusp, there's a threshold between the 100 year cycle and the new one, this, the next 100 year cycle, 
will always be a breathing in, okay? As in that wonderful uh, Goethe poem, uh, that life must twofold be. We breathe air in, then set it free. Um, and, and one binds us, the other allows us to entwine ourselves in the world. And so this is what anthroposophy is really leading us towards now. Those of us who are old enough to have lived in the golden age, let's say of Waldorf education, and I'd say it was the society as well, 1970s, 1980s, up to the early 90s, when OSNA, which is always the bellwether, OSNA is always the barometer of um, how to, you know, that, that good times are coming to an end. When OSNA decided to trademark, service mark the word Waldorf and Waldorf education and Steiner education and truth, duty, goodness, whatever else, that ended, we might say, the golden age of Waldorf education. And now, 30 years later, we are, as it were, coming to uh, the ending, the slow ending of the golden age of Steiner's in, in entwinement with us as anthroposophists, his help and guidance. So no matter how much we screwed up, there was always something to balance. And uh, we didn't have to be accountable because it would all be taken care of for us. Now in this period of contraction, we have to find not, I would say, the collective relationship to one another so much as the individual path that is going to allow us to embody the work of Rudolf Steiner. As those books disappear, as one can no longer trust what one reads on the internet, and that may be all that's available of Steiner's words, it's going to depend on individuals who have made them their own. Um, Paul Sharp told me that Aaron Fried Pfeiffer had taught him to keep a notebook where on one page of the notebook, you would write a quote from Rudolf Steiner on the facing page, it would be a loose leaf notebook, the facing page, you would take something from a newspaper or a magazine today online, which was dealing with the same subject or the same soul condition or whatever, but from a very different point of view. Steiner had taught this to Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer taught it to Paul Sharp. Paul Sharp taught it to me. I wouldn't say I had the exclusive rights to this. Many, many people have done this. In fact, it was a factor in the survival of anthroposophy in Russia um, in the darkest times under Stalin that an old woman had such a book or many such books. So we have to individualize Rudolf Steiner's work. We have to make it our own. We have to become people who can embody Steiner and I'm not just talking about right now, or by the time you're 65 or 70, or by the time I'm 90 or whatever. Um, as my mother would say, you should live so long. Um, but rather, we should also be individually studying that theme that so terrified Henry those years ago, life after death. We should become comfortable with life after death in the way that an explorer would study whatever maps were available. So he didn't even have to look at the maps anymore when he got there. That we can be so comfortable after we cross that threshold that spiritual beings will free us up to help those below, to help those on earth. That is to say that what will be certainly an inadequate, but nonetheless, something of a substitute, something of an equivalent of what Steiner has been doing for us for a century will be the souls of the dead, the souls of departed anthroposophists 
who will be working like the spiritual beings they are, um, who will be working on the angelic, archangelic, archive level, whatever, to help those souls on the earth who have little or no access to Steiner, who may be the souls who will keep those little homeopathic private education associations alive and going so that there can be uh, the possibility of Waldorf education continuing in one shape or form. So number one, try to start study groups if you can for younger people interested in anthroposophy, particularly if they are in a daughter movement Waldorf education is the one I know best, but biodynamics, medicine, whatever, there's, don't assume it's going on. It may not be in a given farm or in a, a given clinic. Um, see if you can help there. Number two, do your own work of study and trying to become less and less just a student of Steiner and more and more uh, someone who perhaps has a graduate degree in the subject um, without having to enroll anywhere. And number three, be ready to cross the threshold and be ready to work there on behalf of anthroposophy. Be ready to, as it were, um, be a kind of, if not initiate, A-T-E at the end, an initiate, E-T-T-E, um, to do something while Steiner is still on the earth in whatever incarnation he might have. And then there'll be a century that will pass. Perhaps you'll return earlier than the usual course of time. And once again, there will be a period of expansion, but we should not worry about the superficialities of how many people are enrolled in that school and uh, how many assets does Rudolf Steiner RSF have now or whatever, those things are no longer going to have much meaning. What's going to have meaning is the inner life of people who are in the here and now working with Steiner. And I just want to finish before opening uh, for comments and questions. It's just about um, the end of an hour. Uh, Words from Ida Wegman in her uh, essay, I Am For Going Forward. What I wanted and regarded as our salvation was for a living circle of wakeful people to form around the prevailing death forces and give rise to new life. A circle consisting as it were of fortresses and grail castles in different countries. So here's Parseval again. He's being kicked out of the Waldorf High School, but this is all people want to talk about. Where people live, but are at the same time so free that they can move from place to place. This realized in the right way, I would have seen as a Michaelic alliance that could bring something new into the world in order to make possible the new life seeking to emerge. And we shouldn't forget, Michael is a time spirit now. And when we speak about times are changing, we need a new curriculum, times are changing, we need to talk about anthroposophy as a collective movement and so on, be very careful, is Michael changing? And in what way is Michael changing? Um, that's what the times are a reflection of. All right, let me stop there. Um, if you need to take a break for a couple of minutes, uh, you know, please do. And um, I'm going to now ask you uh, what I'd like to ask is if you, I, I, I'm terrible at this. I wish that. Uh, Andre could help me here. Andre, could you be the one choosing people for the questions? Okay. 
Well, uh, I can hear you enough and I'll tell the person who they are and they can unmute themselves. Okay, so if you wanna take a break, go ahead. If you wanna ask, I'll, I'll take questions for about half an hour or comments. Okay. Um, I can uh, hear you, yes. And you want me to talk to you on by phone? Okay, I've got you. Leon, okay. 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 I will look at that. I'll look for raised hands. So right now, uh, Leon and, and Helen Lubin. And uh, let me see, I have to switch the photos around. Okay. Okay, so it's two questions so far. Okay, I am going to uh, ask you to unmute, Leon, and you can have the first question. Eugene, it's not a question initially. Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Oh. I can hear Loud as can be. It, it's, it, I want to start with a, a grateful thank you. Um, I can't hear. Oh, this is terrible. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank <laughs> you know what? Maybe if people write their questions as chats, then I'll repeat the question and, and answer it that way. Could you send a chat? You know how to do that, Leon? Down below, yeah. there's a little uh, yeah, like okay. a comic strip quote. And Helen, if you could do the same and anyone else, and I'll see what I can do. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, Leon, could you speak again? Maybe I'll hear you on my phone. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, so good. good. That's the first thing I wanted to say and what I wanted to say if I couldn't say anything more was thank you because uh, I've never heard an anthroposophist speak by starting with full responsibility. When I first, <laughs> when I first lecturers, I could never tell what came from their reading or from their experience because they wouldn't distinguish that. And I'm a scientist, okay. right? <laughs> I'm yes, a biologist, yeah. a psychologist. And it became really obvious. But anyway, um, I, I'm noticing more and more, of course, in life that we're getting this DEI and other, other phenomena occurring in all over the place. And uh, in, now in, uh, in the society in America, and uh, I've been concerned about issues like this. One of my best friends was black in the society and I wanted more friends like that. But I, want, I wanted to take up what you said about fleetingly about Marxism and mentioned that there's a lot of good criticism of DEI on YouTube. Jordan Peterson, for example, Jordan Peterson, you know of him? He, mm -hmm. he also is an individualist rather than a collectivist. And he has given a great lecture on it. And Bishop Barron, a, a, a Catholic bishop, 
very versed in philosophy, looks at it from the point of view of cardinal virtues. Very, very good. And then there's a man named James Livesey, who has followed the whole history from Marx. And he talks about Marx being involved with religion, not econ economy, that he's trying to foist a religion on, on, on the world. And we're getting a lot of uh, information from people who've uh, left Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, about the stages of infiltration uh, in, into other nations where they bring in ideas like this. All those ideas that are called woke right now <laughs> are Marxist, like, as you say. They're ways of putting one group against another group constantly. And I, we got to stop this coming into anthroposophy. I, I, I want to say more, but there's no point. <laughs> OK, all right. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the of course, this issue, these issues can get very political as well, which is another reason that um, the best of them, even with the best intentions, it's very difficult to bring them into the context of a Waldorf school, which is um, so far removed from the political world, from the world of so many of these issues, I would just say even the, you know, we could talk about gun rights, we could talk about euthanasia, we could talk about gender identity, we could bring all these things to a school, but for what purpose? Yeah. What we really should be doing in a Waldorf school is helping children bid farewell to their former incarnations and feel a sense of excitement, enthusiasm, joy, and capability in meeting this new incarnation. We have really the first, all the years of nursery kindergarten and the first five grades in which to do that. In grade six and only in grade six does the child begin and only begin to take on their individual karma. And this is when the world starts to awaken to them and in them. Do that earlier and you are creating the conditions for the psychological confusion of all types and, and uh, manners that we find in children today. They've been awakened too soon and they haven't been able to quietly and inwardly meet their own personal karma. Okay, yeah. let me finish there. Helen was next. So Helen, Helen <laughs> I think I'll hear you on the phone. Go ahead, please. Oh, I don't know how to call you. You don't have to, I can hear you for some reason. Oh, you can hear me? Connection. Oh, okay, I just, yes. I just typed out the thing. Well, I was just saying in regard to your suggestion about a new section of the school for spiritual science, I was thinking if, if one keeps in mind that the full name of the youth section is the section for the spiritual striving of youth. And if one imagined that carried over to a section that would be called the section for the spiritual striving of elders, then it could really be a, um, a place for this impulse that you were describing that would also not just have elderhood identified with gerontology situated within the medical section, but would really free it into the impulse for the future or give it a, a place to be, um, to be um, where one could really become conscious of, of that. Anyway, just thanking you for that. You're very welcome. It could really be the AARP of the ASA, I think we could say. Okay, now let me, uh, I have to go scroll through the, um, the galleries here to get, to see who else has a question. Who is that? Okay, I don't see her. 
Okay, thank you. Sophia, you are next. Thank you. Um, so I'll just lower my hand. There we go. Um, so that was such an interesting talk, so wide ranging. And um, I was, uh, I'm a Waldorf teacher. And so I, I was particularly interested in all you had to say about that. Um, and um, I mean, I've, I've worked with your online conferences for many years, actually. And just the way that life's evolved for me, um, I'm, no longer I'm no longer working in, a, in an in-person Waldorf school, but I'm, doing, I'm in an online program, which I know this might be anathema to many in the Waldorf movement. However, you know, COVID and many other factors have you sure. know, this sort of thing mm. about. And even though things are not as bad as they were some a couple of years ago, you know, many of this many of the students I teach either live in an area where they couldn't access Waldorf education in person because there's right. no school nearby, mm. or as mm. one mother I was talking to recently who was saying her son has many different conditions. He's got ADHD, he's distracted by even if someone's fiddling with a ruler, for example, in the classroom, he just cannot concentrate. Whereas if he's in his own room, he's got his earplugs in, he's just sitting in front of the screen, she says it's amazing. He can just concentrate, he is taking in so much more, and you know, their expectations are massively exceeded in, in what he could achieve and how much he is interested in learning. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just interested to hear what your perspective is uh, on this. I know that, you know, uh, um, you've some, I think you, I believe I'm right in saying that you've said in the part, um, in other lectures I've watched of yours that, um, you know, the Waldorf movement has been too um, sort of uh, resistant to digital technology. And but then maybe the pendulum swung the other way, and the, now we're thinking, right, you know, throwing the yes, baby out yes, of the bathroom. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah. anyway, having had the experience myself of you know being a class mm. teacher for eight, eight years in a in a quite big uh, Waldorf school, um, and now working in a very small kind of homeschool education digital program. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'm just very interested to hear what your perspective is, and I can tell okay. you that you know in you know, where I am now, there's both, you know, we have both people who are very much trained in the equity and inclusion side of things. And then there's people who are a bit more old school, perhaps because I've done so much training with you online that I'm thinking now I'm holding up the banner for, you know, for, for the old, the old traditions. But anyway, I'll, I'll, if, sorry if that was too much to say, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'm interested to hear your perspective. Okay, did everyone hear that? Okay, so first of all, um, since COVID, Waldorf has reluctantly, but been more accepting. And that's why there's a gathering like this. This would not have happened before COVID and why there are online conferences being offered by the training institutes as well as by me. Now, as it happens this weekend, as I speak here, there are a whole lot of people online watching me speak and hearing me speak on an asynchronous conference called Through a Glass Darkly, which is about the challenge of Waldorf, uh, that Waldorf faces through artificial intelligence. And I'll just give you a crazy of what I say about why the boy that you mentioned would be so calm in his own space in front of a screen and not in a classroom because there are only two times in all of human history where people have learned via radiant light. The first time was in the middle ages when stained glass windows became as it were a, a teaching of biblical subjects for the illiterate. That was a big part of what those stained glass windows were about. So a peasant coming into the town could go in and learn what the story was. So there's radiant light from the sun shining through. And of course, uh, those especially in monasteries might only be able to afford one stained glass window. 
but that became a meditative center because of the way the sun moved through the day and changed the colors and changed the forms. Then we could say, though it still exists, the art of stained glass became fairly uh, passive, fairly um, subdued, and is not considered one of the major art forms today. Um, so what do we have instead? Another way of learning via radiant light. Right here, radiant light, and I'm learning from it, who's calling me, who's texting me, um, what Shakespeare has to say today or whatever. This is why there are children who were in the Middle Ages deeply connected to stained glass, probably monks or at least individuals of a deeply meditative cast who come back looking for it in our time. Now, what would a monk do? He would make a pledge perhaps to silence. Some of these individuals, a whole lot of them are selectively mute or don't talk at all. He would make a pledge to chastity and to not be a social human being. Some of these individuals who love looking at these screens are diagnosed as autistic spectrum because they have such poor social skills. They can't tell when you're smiling that that means you're happy or things like that. The screen and the autistic individual are deeply connected. They show the problems of our time, the difficulty of incarnating. And what did Steiner do in the Gertianum? He wanted bright light to be there so that one could see the cupola. He put in electrical lights, a big shock to the members. What did he do in terms of natural light? Colored glass windows. He developed a new way of allowing light to pass through big blocks of single blocks of colored glass and to etch them with a diamond tip dentist drill. Asya Tregenya helped him with that because he understood that there would be spiritual seekers in our time needing the experience of radiant light. And it is a pity that there is so little in the way of work with colored glass, stained glass in the Waldorf movement, anthroposophical work altogether. Carlo Pietzner, the leader of the Camp Hill movement in the United States for many years, there was a stained glass master. He went all over the world, including some Waldorf schools creating stained glass windows. And another individual who still lives on very vitally is named Alan Thewlis who's a lecturer, teacher, uh, who works with uh, children with special needs in the Camp Hill movement in Pennsylvania and does stained glass work with uh, some of the young people. This is priceless. So here's something that um, we could really be doing more of. One of Steiner's impulses that just kind of got buried. One of the, the windows, as Asya Turgenev was working on it, these, these slabs of glass cost a fortune. This was high tech work. The dentist drill was very fast and everything. She was working and working and suddenly a huge crack appeared in the window and she ran to Steiner in tears. I, I it did something terrible. I and Steiner, Steiner laughed. He said, you broke a window. <laughs> How did you know? I was holding Araman hostage here so that I could do better, a better representation of him in my sculpture. When I let him go, he was so annoyed that he went and broke the window in spite. So that's how important these windows are and we do nothing with them. These can be, if we're talking about anthroposophy, healing everybody, work with those windows, even reproductions of them, and then try to see if we can work with slabs of glass. That can be something the elder section can do in its arts and crafts room. Okay.
Thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you. Um, another question. Andre, who should I be calling on now? Oh, okay, hold on. Let me get the, I see 12 chats, uh-oh. All right. <clears throat> um, this is, well, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's Buck Owens, not Buck Henry, who sang the song, they're gonna put me in the movies. Thank you very much. At least I was right about Ringo Starr. Um, this is a very good question from Pete. Uh, where do we see threefolding in this constructive period? Um, I'd have to say in these little communities that will form. Um, and of course, Steiner said again and again that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for anthroposophy to move forward as a world movement without threefolding really coming first. But of course, it's hard to bring threefolding to people who know nothing about Steiner. So this is another aspect, I think, of this period of contraction, that it may be a period of learning how to threefold on a very small scale. There certainly have been Waldorf schools that have tried this. For the most part, it's failed. And there we're talking about faculties of 30, 40, 50 people. So it's like herding cats, you know? Um, it's so obvious when one reads the threefold social order, how right it is, but to bring it into the will, which is where the consciousness soul uh, belongs, very, very difficult. So I think it's an important question. Um, not much has come in this expansive period of the last century, and we'll have to see how or what it works um, to go forward. Um, Ross Rentea asked, what is DEI? And someone answered, diversity, equity, inclusion. And it is now a J is added to that for justice. And um, one must say that these groups also have a kind of, uh, they are made up of people from a school but they have a group behind them that also sort of uh, sets the curriculum, sets the agenda for what's going on. And these groups are becoming more and more influential and more and more powerful in the life of school. And there is essentially little or nothing anthroposophical there. Once again, nothing wrong with their ideals, but put it in a Waldorf school and, uh, it may not be the right combination. Waldorf schools can't do everything. And the most important thing they can do is to try to work out of anthroposophy to give children something unique. Add all this other stuff and the Waldorf school is more and more mainstream and is able to offer a less and less unique education. Catherine Padley, what role and how do you imagine Eurythmy could move into the future to support what you are speaking about? Um, it's extremely, extremely important. And there again, um, Eurythmy has never taken on the large role in the United States that, for example, it had um, years back in Germany where it was representing uh, the uh, Western Germany and a great uh, kind of dance group um, of Europe. Um, it's going to be once again, something that will be connected to the small communities. Therapeutic Eurythmy, um, Eurythmy to help people counterbalance their, their uh, experiences of technology, very, very important and Eurythmy as an art form. Um, I couldn't say more beyond that. And, uh, okay, the Eurythmy question again. Um, uh, let me, well, I couldn't hear you. 
What did you say? Okay, Russell, go ahead. Eugene, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to um, throw in somewhat of a comment or a suggestion or idea. So I've been reading this lecture from uh, December 23rd, 1920 in Basel from Rudolf Steiner about uh, it was it's about well what is it exactly about it's kind of about the uh, the Christmas festival and impulses from the Christmas festival uh, but what I have come to appreciate especially from this lecture and what he suggests in this lecture is that on the theme of the healing of the world with anthroposophy he um, very much talks about this in this lecture and particularly in relation to or on the basis of anthroposophy and the sciences. And I've just recently started working in the mathematical section here at the Gutianum in Dornach. I'm right here next to the, the Gutianum is right there. <laughs> um, but I've come to- Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes, <We're> yes. <laughs> Thank you for talking here. <laughs> um, and I've come to feel very strongly that the 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 attack or the assault on anthroposophy in the heart of the Waldorf schools that I've kind of seen from somewhat of an outside perspective is really only kind of a secondary attack that these people who are coming in about uh, racial issues are actually not essentially necessarily hostile to the core of anthroposophy but there's the real attack is about the sciences and about the desire to really instill atomism in children at an early age yeah. Yeah. and i think those people are kind of piggybacking on this general unrest about racial issues to try to attack and unseat anthroposophy from the sciences and um so i just i i uh would be interested in engaging on some level about um, how this, how maybe from the section, how we could possibly engage in discussions or in, in work with Waldorf schools. So I wanted well, to put that out there, and particularly yeah. to you and to anyone else listening would be interested in engaging on that. I just want to mention that uh, among our um, group today is uh, Ross Rentea, who um, has brought a lot of uh, depth to the uh, scientific approach to medicine in the United States. Um, you know, not just creating medicines based on Steiner's indications and formulas, but also trying to test, develop tests, and you know. Uh, bring something that will really help uh, raise um, anthroposophical medicine and anthroposophical approach to science one or two niches up. It's a very difficult matter. It's significant that the first Waldorf critic who created the Waldorf critics list and began the first wave of panic when he went online and nobody in the Waldorf movement was online Dan Dugan, who was himself an electrical engineer, his critique was originally that Waldorf schools teach pseudoscience. They teach that the heart is not a pump. They teach that Newton was wrong and Goethe was right about color and so on. So this is where it began and you're quite right. This continues to work very, very strongly. And I would say, in the training centers, in the trainings, in the summer conferences, that the approach to Waldorf science grows weaker and weaker and is going over, especially because public schools are sometimes um, having to face a very different science curriculum than uh, independent Waldorf schools do. Um, the sciences, conventional science, and science that's very antagonistic to Steiner is absolutely not just creeping in, but sometimes coming in with a big roar. Textbooks and uh, 
asking students to utilize critical thinking rather than just to live with the phenomena and so on. And I, I think you're quite right that this is going to be more and more under attack uh, along with so many other aspects of Waldorf education that uh, DEI is just uh, a more acceptable front in a way, but that others will, as you say, piggyback. So I hope that the science section is, is there to help. Now, it just turned a uh, half hour, 4.30 my time. You can figure that out I'm on the East Coast. Uh, so I think it's time to end. Um, anything that you want to add, Andre? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I am also willing, I'm always willing, number one, to answer people's questions. And I will be sending to Andre um, a kind of site that I will have with resources and other links that have to do with this subject, if you're interested in that. Um, so Andre will be able to send that email that to you or have it at least on the Chicago branch website. And when will the lecture be available as a recording? Do you have a date or? Wow, okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay. So you have to go to the Chicago a branch program page, and you'll find there a link to the um, uh, recording of, of this afternoon's um, talk. Okay, that's very, very quick. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just um, see where there are questions. A lot of people just made very nice statements. Thank you very much for um, your kind words. Um, Yeah, you're with me. I actually, that's it as far as questions go. Oh, raised hands. Okay, let me go to 4.45 my time. That's another 12 minutes. And uh, <laughs> okay, if you just done, tell me who it is, name the person, go ahead. Okay. Chesa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I see you right there. Okay, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, like everyone else, first of all, let me thank you. But then I would also like to bring back to the point when we were discussing or uh, mentioning the importance of the individual against the collective versus the collective. From my personal experience and point of view, we are responsible individually for what we do in the world, which also means the learning about spiritual science and carrying what we've learned and metabolized within ourselves into the world. And only after we have done this during the present incarnation, will we be able, as you suggested very clearly, to help the living soul on earth after we have crossed over. But the accountability that is not a characteristics of anthroposophy apparently, uh, needs to become a reality. We absolutely need to bear with our own full being, what it is to be an anthroposophist. And only then we can find the right voice and words to uh, engage with the wider public, which we can do every day if we so choose. Thank you. I really can't add anything to that. I thank you for those words very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, um, I will just again, thank you all very much for coming. I know I have probably said a few things that uh, might be shaking the boat a little bit, but I just would say, um, put my uh, dire straits predictions to the test and see for yourself um, how conferences are being presented when you get a notice about an upcoming conference or workshop. How is it being presented? What is it asking of you? And how much is it saying it's going to give you almost automatically just for showing up? And I'd also say if you're connected to a Waldorf school, as I know a number of you are, or if you are a friend of a Waldorf school, um, just observe for yourself um, not only how many kids are wearing black hoodies or something along those lines, but what do the teachers seem to be feeling? Look at the teachers. Do they seem to be joyful? Do they seem to be exhausted? And I wouldn't look at them right now. It's the end of the school year. But when school starts again next year, watch those teachers. I've often told schools when I visit them and they say, how do you make a judgment? You know, we're asking you to advise us on some very big questions. How do you make a judgment about whether our school is doing well or not? And when do you make that judgment? How long do you have to be here? I said, let me answer the when first. I have to be here 30 seconds to a minute. And then how? I look at the receptionist's face. That's how I can tell right away, how is this school doing? That's all you have to do. If you wanna go a little bit further, visit fourth grade, meet the fourth graders and they will tell you how the school is. You'll come into the room and they'll say, who are you? What, are you allowed in? What are you doing here? Or they'll say, come on in, can I show you my book? Look, her book's much better and so on. You'll see very, very quickly. So um, it doesn't take much to see where we are heading right now but it takes a whole lot to resolve to perhaps try to do something about it, even if not right now in the here and now, even if in the hereafter, we can still be effective. Okay, with that, I will thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Andre, and uh, thank you, Apple, for um, making it possible for us to overcome Zoom. And I guess, we stop now. Okay. Farewell, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. And Bye. thank you so much for this incredible event. So long. Katie from Ann Arbor. Thank and you thank so you, much, Andre, Eugene. for organizing. Thank you, Eugene. This. Oh, thank, thank you, you Andre, Andre, for bringing this. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Let's be uh, charter members of the Elders Group. We are. <laughs> we are right here. <laughs> I'm going to sign up with you, Andre, and we'll get everybody else's email. So long. <laughs>